Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, we thank you uh, for joining us today on, on OSI webinar, um, Improving Gas Separator in Unconventional EASP Application. Um, Neil and I, we're gonna uh, present this webinar to you. Uh, just, uh, we're waiting for him. Neil, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I'm just waiting real quick on my video to start. There you go. Okay, perfect. Good morning, everybody. I hope uh, uh, you and your families around the globe are all safe and healthy and are taking all the necessary precautions in these turbulent times. Uh, I know it's, things are difficult right now. Uh, and so we decided, we thought we'll make the most of it and just talk about some you know, different topics uh, at least once or twice a week. So uh, my name is Neil Johnson Mazapoli, and I've been with the company over two years now working as a technical services engineer. And uh, we have Carlos over here as well, working as a technical services engineer, obviously. Yeah, but uh, today we'll be discussing on uh, some, we're just gonna go look over some of the things that happens, you know, in uh, high GOR, GLR wells and how to improve gas separation efficiencies in unconventional ESP applications. But uh, in today's presentation, Carlos, could you move to the next slide? Uh, so yeah, in today's webinar, we're just briefly gonna go over the introduction. We're just gonna understand a little bit about GOR, GLR production. Most of y'all probably already know most of it, but now we're gonna look at how this free gas affects um, pump performance, that is ESP performance. And uh, we're gonna see some of the, how we can identify these parameters. You know, uh, sensor parameters are something that uh, like instantly gives us exactly what we're supposed to know uh, what's going on down hole. So, uh, the other thing we're going to move on to is we're going to look at some of the current solutions uh, for uh, you know gas wells and ESP applications. How ESPs can handle uh, gas, uh, which is currently available either you know uh, in the market. Uh, and then we're going to move to uh, this new technology, the main topic of this webinar, uh, that is uh, uh, the Guardian Shield. We're going to look into the design principles and how. Uh, how it basically increases the efficiency of the pump and keeps the gas either separated or entrained in inside of the liquid. So after that, we're going to go uh, very quickly into the case studies. We're going we're gonna to have two case studies in the Permian Basin in Wolf Camp A formation. And finally, we're going to be waiting here for all the questions that you all have. Once again, thank you all for joining us. Uh, all right, Carlos, let's, we can start. So this right here is a typical unconventional well production graph as many of y'all are already familiar with. Uh, we can see um, uh, most of these unconventional wells, they start off very well, but uh, the, the depletion is very steep and the production goes low and there's a very steep increase in the gas production. That is exactly why when we install an ESP to handle such high production rates, even before the production goes out of the pump curve, there's a lot of gas that the ESP has to handle. That is pretty much why uh, uh, it's very important to make sure that no matter uh, to first first of all understand what's the what's the probability of you know the the gas to and how much it can actually be severe, and then make a design accordingly. So that's pretty much what we're trying to uh, accomplish in this webinar. All right, so yeah, this is some of the typical flow regimes in, you know, in an unconventional well. In the lateral section, we do see a stratified smooth wavy and annular flow that's not as uh, severe when it comes to, you know, maintaining performance for ESPs. But what really affects the uh, performance is the bubble slugs. You know, there, there are these slugs that comes uh, in, in like sections uh, followed by production like fluid production. This is something that we're gonna, we also did a very interesting test with uh, Texas Tech. That's something we're gonna be uh, showing you all as well in the, in the next few slides. But uh, as these slugs go into the vertical section, you through the tangent, there's some of these gas slugs, they kind of break and basically become smaller bubbles. So the combination of these gas bubble slugs and the smaller bubbles is what, you know, makes this a, a very difficult for ESPs to uh, perform at high efficiencies. 
So yeah, typically, in, I mean, in the, in the low GLR wells, um, most of the uh, high fluid levels keep most of the gas entrained inside of the liquid. Though the ga- the the pump really does not have to deal with any of those free gases that actually is mm, more deadly uh, when it comes to performances. So in uh, low GLR wells, even at the kickoff point, if you look at if you look at where the ESP is landed, that's pretty much where most of the ESPs are landed in an unconventional well that that is at the kickoff point. But as the in the, what we see in a higher uh, a GLR wells or GOR wells is that these bottom hole pressures they go way lower than the low the gas bubble pressure. It's exactly why we see a lot of these gases initially entrained just starts to free up, and as, before it reaches that kickoff point where we actually see a lot of these turbulent gas slugs and gas bubbles, they're all freed up, and that is exactly what this PSP has to handle. So unless and until it's either separated or gotten back into solution, it's going to be very difficult for the ESP to perform. This is the test that I was talking about earlier, which is pretty interesting. Just try to, what we're trying to do here uh, or is basically simulate what happens in an unconventional well. And we're going to see like a slow motion video. There's going to be a little pause, but you can see these gas slugs and these production going like in sections. And that is pretty much what the ESP has to handle. You know, there's this there's this different densities that goes and comes, goes and comes. It just goes up and up, up and down. That's exactly why it is so difficult for it to maintain that uh, that high efficiency. So if you look, like I said, it's a little slow motion just to make sure that we see how that production just moves like uh, in sections. And as it goes to the vertical section, when it goes through the tangent area, and right when it reaches the kickoff point, you know, that's pretty much where, like I mentioned earlier, the ESP is lands. The, the ESP has to handle some of these gas bubbles that breaks because of the turbulence and most of these gas lugs are still there. So this was a pretty interesting, and this is something that we can typically expect in these unconventional wells, um, just because of uh, these gassy, especially in these gassy wells. But yeah, what are the f- effects of free gas? And it's I mean, pretty much everybody already knows what exactly we can expect when you know the, the well is actually gassy and we know that it is going to be gassy. These smaller stagnant uh, bubbles, they basically go and land in the low pressure zones of the impeller wings. And what they eventually do is they create a big pocket of gas, which eventually over time leads, not even, it doesn't even take that long, but it leads to a gas lock, which eventually leads to the ESP failure. Uh, that is just one of it. If you look at the image on the right hand side, you can see some sand with some scale formation. That is another thing uh, is that due to these gas presence, you know, we, we see high motor temperatures, uh, which basically promotes the formation of these scale. And not only around the motor, it, even in the, at the intake or inside of the pump itself, which eventually leads to another uh, failure that is caused because of gas. So some of the, one of the ways, uh, Carlos, can you move to the next one? One of the ways that we can understand or identify these uh, that we, we're definitely going to have have some issues with the pump is when we see some significant difference in the motor temperatures and the fluid temperatures. If you look closely, uh, it's, there's a difference of 35. Now, this is still a better, like it's still a little better compared to some what we've seen uh, in the in this uh, some of these wells where the motor temperature is there's a difference of 60 70 Fahrenheit between the fluid temperature and motor temperature. Now, obviously, the reason why this happens is because you know we have gas around the motor which does not have that convection between uh, to basically cool down the motor compared to what a uh, fluid a higher density fluid would do. Uh, the other thing is going to be it's very difficult to get the PIPs down to what's desirable in that particular well or whatever the lifeline of the, the well is. And uh, most of these parameters, they kind of work hand in hand. So we see a lot of these fluctuations in motor frequencies and currents. And that's why we have a lot of these shutdowns because they have the threshold values and it goes up and down just because of the uh, ESP needing to handle these different densities of uh, of of fluids, gas, and liquid. But this is pretty much how we can understand or we see or identify. But um, we more to Carlos is going to talk about some of the current gas solutions, how we're dealing with it, and also talk about the main topic of this 
presentation. Thank you so much, Neil. Uh, once again, I thank you all for being here on uh, today's webinar. My name is Carlos Portilla. I'm a, a technical service engineer here in OSI. So <clears throat> uh, to follow up the, the, the gas well, gas wells issues. So as um, uh, Neil mentioned before, we have uh, problems related with uh, high motor temperatures. We can lead to uh, decrease the lifetime of the motor and decrease the runtime of the well. So we're always looking to uh, avoid gas lock um, and motor and high motor uh, temperatures, but also there is uh, some other inconvenience that we can find when we have gas lock on the pumps. So in some cases, there is no way that we can monitor the, 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 the temperature of the pump. So sometimes what happens is that the pump, it gets so heat up that it kind of melts the, lead, the motor lead and then when we have some like a, a small damage on the motor lead, the gas can enter into the into the cable, and that we can that, that we call it a decompression damage. So that, that can also decrease the runtime of the well. So there is so many uh, aspects that uh, that we need to uh, fix. So the the all the companies, service companies, and operators have come with many solutions over many years of research and application. Some of them that they are like we, we can classify them. So some of them are operational, such as increasing the tubing pressure by adding some type of back pressure system. So what we're gonna do, we're looking for is to put the gas back into solution, pressurizing that that tubing. Um, on the the, on the other solution that we can find normally just decreasing uh, that casing pressure. So it just open that casing and release that pressure. So if the natural gas efficiency on the casing, on the annular space will be higher because there's not gonna be a back pressure on the casing, pressure down the, the level fluid and uh, just, it, it will make things easier on the annulus. Another thing that um, we normally see uh, here in the premium and worldwide basically is the BSD control. So, Basically, because we have, uh, when we have a gas flow, we will have two phases. Uh, we will be pumping two phases, so liquid and gas. So basically, these two phases will be uh, changing their properties because uh, there is a, a constant pressure change when we're pumping. So the, the motor load will be affected. So basically, what we do is that through uh, programming, and there are some pretty good software out there that some of the ESP companies use, is just to, to manage the frequency to maintain what we can call a good load. And so we can maintain um, uh, the more, the, the, the stable, the better on the, in the frequency, on the load of the motor, so we can extend the, the runtime of the well. So on the, the pumps, so the ESP companies, they have come up with uh, many different solutions on, on the pumps and the pump stages. So we have, for example, the, the normal radial pumps, uh, they can handle up to 10% of uh, free gas. The, the mixed, uh, the mixed um, flow stages, they can uh, manage 15 to 20% free gas. But more than that, it becomes a problem. So uh, many ESP companies, they have modified the impellers and the diffusers. So... So what we can do is when the, the fluid with the gas is already inside of the pump, right? So what we want is just to try to homogenize the fluid. So we have bubbles and we have liquid. So what the, these, these kind of pumps they're looking for is to break those, those bubbles. So make the bubbles as small as possible. So we, we, we can simulate uh, like one phase fluid. So is more is more like small bubbles will disperse into the fluid and it will make it like it will make it easier to to pump this kind of fluid and the other function will be like to pressure up a little bit of that fluid in those stages so we can uh, like the same concept put that gas back in solution and then avoid gas locking and all the problems um in this case we have uh some other solutions which are additional that the pump stages so they operational. So we have like a, we can call it gas separators, and uh, in in some in, in the case of the rotary systems, are gas handlers. But so let's go over this so we can understand the basis of the the gas separation um, application. 
So we have the reverse flow gas separator here. So this one is a no active gas separator. So we don't have, um, so what we do here is that we're controlling the flow path of the, of the fluid. So what we're doing is like the, the fluid is gonna come, uh, it's gonna, it's gonna flow upwards here as we see you the the arrows here and the gas bubbles because of the the velocity of the 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 rising velocity of the gas bubble it will allow it to separate gas naturally in this space so we're making the fluid uh to flow downwards into the gas separator and then upwards again so and the, this the so we're forcing the fluid to separate the gas naturally just by the, uh, the difference between densities and velocities so we have our uh, ga advanced gas handler, which is like, uh, imagine like the pump stages. So as we as I explained before, the, these, the, the purpose of this is to homogenize the entire uh, fluid that we're pumping. So we have gas bubbles, big, big gas bubbles. Each one of these uh, stages will break those, those bubbles and will make it easier than for the pump in the pumps, the, the pump stages installed above to uh, manage that fluid, which will be like more like a one phase um, fluid. This, this is a rotary system, as I mentioned before. So we have our gas separator here. So what the gas separator does is, uh, um, so it separates densities. So the, the heavier density will be separated to the walls of the separator. So what it does is that we're the, the same concept. So we are ma we're making the fluid to flow through this separator, and then this helix. So this helix, what they do is that they separate the, the liquid and the gas by densities, uh, sending the the liquid to the walls of the of the separator, and then the gas will be uh, stuck in the middle. So then we we have some um, some connections here that will allow the gas uh, trapped in the middle of the separator to be perched to the annular area and then up to the casing. So we have another application that uh, the oil and gas industry has been done constantly is that the shroud application. So there is many, many, many applications, many designs on the shroud. So there is advantages and disadvantages on many of these uh, options. So we're gonna show you just some of them. So as we know, I mean, on the unconventional, we need to, um, we need to always uh, have in mind, uh, I mean, we're gonna um, place the pump above the perforations always. So in this case, some of the, the, the shrouds application, I mean, they, 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 they are not very successful here, but we're gonna go through all of them. So, so we got the inverted shroud. So the inverted shroud, we have two options sometimes. Uh, the, the, the shroud only covers the intake. So what it does, is that allows that gas that is here on the annular to uh, keep rising up to the, the the casing, and we can purge that casing, the, that casing pressure. So we're we're uh, we're avoiding that gas to flow into the intake and up to the pump intakes. But what is the disadvantage of this? That like in the like in the in the for example here in the permian basin, we always have sand production. So here, what we're gonna have is that we're gonna have most likely sand deposited in this part of the uh, at the bottom of the um, of the uh, the shroud so that could be an inconvenient always so and um and so that's something that we need to keep in mind another um inverted shroud that we have seen is um so this one so uh, the the purpose of of the shroud is the same so in this case, we are um, isolating the entire ESP assembly, okay? So, but what are we doing is that uh, because the intake is here, right? And the fluid is, is, is I mean, it's, it's flowing upwards and then downwards, but the movement of the fluid in the motor is not gonna be as significant as it should be. So the, 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 the heat transfer between the fluid and the motor could be affected. Right, so that's why uh, in some in some application this could not be as successful as in others. Also, the the sand could be deposited. I mean, could could fall into this section. So we need to be very careful with that application. 
Um, so we have here another shrouded ESP with a gas separator with the deep tube. So the same concept, what it does is that we make the, we, we, we place the deep tube below the perforations. So what we, do, what we do is that the gas bubbles will start rising up the casing. And uh, so what we can call the, the leak, the, the clean fluid will flow through the deep tube. And then it will, because the movement will be constant, so there, there will be a proper cool. The, the cooling of the motor will be uh, better. Okay, and the last application, which uh, we're gonna be focused on later on, is uh, when we have the connection of the of the shroud at the very bottom. All right. So below below the sensor, we will have um, um, a specific a specific distance between the shroud and our 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 connection. And then here we can have either a sand separation system or a gas separation system, uh, like in this case, or a combination between those two. And we will be um, assuring that we will have a proper cooling. Um, we're not gonna have uh, the problem of the sand because we're gonna keep pumping and the, the fluid is gonna keep moving. So this case, the, this will avoid any inconvenience that the other uh, designs uh, can have. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. So um, this is a current solution for a gas world. It's more than separate gas. So what we're doing here is handling the gas, all right? So basically the assembly that we have here, let me just put my pen. So basically what we have here is an isolating point. So we are not using a shroud here, but we do need to isolate the ESP because we need to make sure that the fluid will go through the gas handling system. In this case, is uh, the ESP vortex regulator. So what we do here is that we force the fluid to get into our uh, gas separator body, all right? So the gas separator body is basically, it has two, uh, two different diameters, okay? So what this allows us is to, um, is to control those gas bubbles that they are rising because like we have here our vortex uh, equipment, which will help us to break those gas slugs. And then the, 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 the gas, the gas, uh, the gas bubbles by, by, by the difference of density and uh, the buoyant forces, it will they will start rising and they will be purged by this section. Okay. So when they, they're purged in this section, they will keep, uh, they keep moving upwards. All right, so what we're gonna have here is we're gonna have a, a pressure zone. Okay, so in the in the in the packer in the lower uh, zone of the packer, here we will have an increase in pressure. And what and what does that mean? So so uh, we have we have um, the pressure here. And uh, so what, what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to put that gas back into solution. Okay, so we have our uh, solution, the gas solution here. So what basically you are doing is that when we have, uh, let's say that um, our example is here, and at this point, we're increasing the, the pressure. So if we're increasing the pressure just a little bit, so we will have a high um, gas in solution. So what we, we're doing is, this is a cycle basically. So we're, Putting the gas back in solution, and then we're uh, they we're pumping the gas. I mean, not pumping, but um, leaving leaving the, the 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 fluid to go through. And so this will be a cycle. So there will be uh, uh, an increase in, in in pressure here, higher uh, um, gas in solution. It will flow down here because it will be uh, gas like purging from here, and then we will start producing. And then the, the fluid is gonna come up here. With a with a with a, with more gas in solution, so it will be easier for the for the, the pump to handle um, that fluid. All right, so let's move on. So the 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 solution that we want to present you today is the new gas mitigation technology. We name it uh, Guardian Shield. So basically, we have a few concepts that they are going to be going on on this application. So what we need to understand is that something is going to happen on the on the on the annular area, and then some other concepts will happen on 
inside of the gas separator. But the gas separator will be affecting both separation on the annular and separation on the inside. So basically, let's start with the intake section. So we have here two tubing screens. So um, for the ones that are not familiar with the tubing screen is, so it's a perforated tubing with a B-wire, a specialized B-wire um, that covers the, 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 the pipe. So in this case, what we're doing is um, we're, uh, uh, we're helping to coalesce the bubble, so make the bubbles bigger. So a bigger bubble, it will be easier to separate, to separate. So in this case, so we're, we're using normally a 50 slot. So the 50 slot means that there is a, a distance of 0 0.05 inches between uh, each wire. Let me show you. So basically this distance right here will be 0 .0, 0 0.05 inches. All right, so this in two tubing screens, it's about 1,800 uh, square inches. So what we're trying to do here is avoid turbulence. So at this point, we don't, ha we don't want um, turbulence because that will generate small bubbles. So what we, we want now is to make them bigger so it will be easier to separate them later. But what happens is that we're looking for now is that you will have two velocities going on here. So we'll have the velocity of the liquid, so the superficial liquid velocity, and you will have the rising bubble velocity. So both of them, they depend on densities and fluid properties, and of course, pressure, pressure changes. So what we, we're trying to do is always, when we're separating gas, so we're trying to make the fluid to, uh, to move as slow as possible. So the, the biggest bubbles will, will rise, and then we can purge them to the casing and outside of our system. So that is our uh, our tubing screen. Then we have our two gas separator bodies, as I explained before, uh, these gas separator bodies as the different, so it, these are different from the one that I explained before. So these doesn't have, these don't have any slots, all right? So the only perch, the only perch area will be at the very top of our gas separator. Okay, and um, so basically what we're looking for here is, so we will separate gas naturally on the outside and then we will decrease the velocity on the inside. So we will explain that later on just to make sure that everything is clear. And then we have our vortex. So the vortex we will explain later on on the, on the helix size, how important this is uh, to increase uh, the, to enhance the separation of fissions. And on the ESP part, so we have our shroud system. In this case, we have um, the application for this technology. We clamp the, the shroud above the intake, and then we connect it. Um, we, uh, we connect our equipment right below the connection of the shroud. So we have installed in many options. So twin seven eight, three and a half, four and a half. So, but always we need to keep this in mind: the connection that we're having, because. As you can see on the uh, right hand side, so this is the, the, the inner flow pad, right? So what we see in here is that if, after the fluid goes all the way down, so it will flow through our tubing screens, and then it will flow, let me just show you, and this is easier. All right, so it will flow through the, the, the tubing screen, and then down the, the the gas bodies, right, and then it will start. It will start to uh, to be pumped up to the to the pump uh, through a deep tube. All right, so it's a smaller um, a smaller um, part of the uh, a smaller inner part of the gas separator. All right, so in this case, so for example, if it's two and seven inches, the deep tube will be one inch and a quarter. So we need to keep in mind that because we, here we will have a, a different um, a different connection. So we will have so it will be from one inch and a quarter to four inches or three inches and a half, depending on the, the on the shroud uh, design. But so we don't want expansion when it's the when the when the fluid is already inside of the system. All right. So we will explain that later. on. Okay, let's continue. One second. Right, 
So here we have um, some some specifications about about our our application. What is that here? Okay. So basically, um, this is the, the normal assembly that we do with uh, the Guardian Shield. So we have uh, an encapsulated um, system, as I mentioned before, clamp on top of the the intake. In this case, we have two upper tandem gas separators, which will um, it's, it's the same concept that I explained before, homogenize uh, that, uh, that, that gas um, phase. We have our, our intake seals, motor, so the motor, so which is like uh, the biggest part on the ESP. So we always have to be care very careful be between the ID of the shroud and OD of the motor. So we have to have that enough clearance so the, the fluid can, can pass through there and cool our motor. All right, so and we, we can uh, make a proper tra a heat transfer between the fluid and the motor. So in this case, so we have a uh, downsized motor from 4.56 to 3.75, which is the, this case. All right, and in this case, we have a 27H um, connection. All right. Move on with the next one. The next one. So this will be our video. So we we're going to explain every principle here, right? So I, as we mentioned before, here we have the intake uh, set of our gas separator. So in this case, we are not looking for separate sand here. The 50 slot, um, it will it, it will break the sand locks, but we're not going to filtrate much sand here. So there there are many other applications, but in this case, we're focusing only on sand. So again, what we're looking for here is the coherence of the bubbles, not generating turbulence. Okay, so moving on. So now the dual flow system will be installed in each of our tools, right? So the dual flow system, as you see here, so it will be the connection. So the, the, the let's use this. So the connection here. Uh, so it will be the 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 space in the middle. So it will be the the, the space for the deep tube, right? So the one inch and a quarter, one inch, one inch and a half, depending on the size of the um, of the gas separator. And then these slots, okay, these slots will help us out to to try to filtrate those gas bubbles that are big enough to. Uh, to be separated there, and then they can rise up there. So we can see in the video, let's move on with the video. So as you see here, we, we have our, um, we kind of uh, separating the, 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 the biggest bubbles here, all right? And then by the, the differential velocity of the two phases, we can separate the we can start separating the gas from there. Now we have uh, we have that connection in in, in all of our uh, sections. So we have so we have on the our two tubing screens, and uh, we have it on the two separated parts. So we will have all the way down to maximize that separation efficiency. All right, so now we have we, we go through the, the, the gas separator bodies. So because the gas separator bodies they have a different diameter, is gonna something is gonna happen. There is a pressure change and, and a velocity change that's gonna happen at the at the, uh, the outside of the separator, and then something different will happen on the inside of the separator. So now here, so what we have here on the on the small uh, area between the our separator and our casing. Is that we're gonna we're gonna have a, a pressure a, a pressure differential between these two phases. So let's um, okay. There we go. So we have the Bernoulli principle here. So what we we're facing always is there is gonna be uh, a relation between the velocity and the pressure. So what we want here on the exterior is to separate the gas as much as possible. All right. So if we separate the gas, like decreasing that pressure on that point. And then, um, and then on top, we'll see that the, the velocity will increase. Uh, so that that will help us to rise that those gas bubbles and increase that separation efficiency. And then, 
let's see on the interior. So on the interior of the gas separator body, what we're looking for is the difference. So now the, 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 the gas bubbles and the fluid is already inside of the separator. So what we're looking for here is that to decrease the velocity on, on this area, let me show you. So to decrease the velocity on the biggest OD section, all right? So basically what we're doing here is to try to, uh, try to increase that differential um, in the velocity of the liquid and the bubble rising velocity so we can have uh, our separation here. So even though there will be bubbles down, uh, flowing down into the gas separator, so for the differential between the velocity of the, in this case, uh, the section one and section two, so we will have um, that, that, that advantages on the, the velocity from the rising bubbles, so we can uh, get those up to the, to the, um, to the um, top section and perch to the casing. Let's move on. Okay. So we're gonna see that on the video right now. So see, uh, so we're, gonna, we're, we're seeing a reduction in velocity and they, they, this will help us to uh, get those bubbles up and uh, to purge these, these bubbles to the casing. So there's many, many aspects that we need to take in consideration. Another one is the, our vortex. So what the vortex separator, so th this is a very, a very uh, unique design that we have different helix sizes with different angles and different distance between each helix. What it does is that it helps us out to create a different um, centrifugal force in, in, in terms of magnitude. So we have here on the board, we will have turbulence on one hand, and then we will have a centrifugal force on the other hand. So what we're looking for here is not to create as much turbulence as, uh, uh, as, as in a sand separation system, um, uh, there was a webinar that um, our co-workers Donovan and Shivani, they present in relate of uh, sand separation systems. Uh, this is another webinar of OSI. So they, they, they focus more on sand. So there will be like a different uh, helix size on this application. But on the gas separator, what we're looking for is to have uh, just a, uh, a medium that can break those gas locks if they reach this point. So we, we then, the, let me show you. So then, when the fluid is start going down and then going up, what we can we we call the clean fluid. All right. So it will be uh, with. Uh, and we are not ingesting, or we are the, the the fluid is not flowing through the deep tube with the up with big bubbles. So the the vortex is gonna take care of that. However, so now because we have a vortex separator at the bottom, we will always have to have tailpipes. So even though the, the the sand separation, the sand separation is not what we aim here. For example, on the unconventional wells, because we use tons of pounds of sand to frack the well, then we have 40, 70, 100 mesh. And then most likely, or most of these wells, they keep producing the 100 mesh for a very long time. So if we have the vortex gas separator here, we always advise and encourage our customers to install at least three or four tailpipes if the problem is not severe, because the vortex is still is going gonna, gonna to separate some sand, and um, if we if we plug, I mean that that section, it could be a problem. So it just better be be careful and be safe, and just to install a couple of tailpipes if the problem is not severe. So once again, if you are like more interested in a combination and a sand, uh, sand configuration, we have another very interesting um, webinar that um, our co-worker Shivani and Donovan presented the other day. It's on our YouTube channel, by the way. All right, so, um, and then we see our fluid, our clean fluid, what we can call it, uh, being, um, being uh, flowing up to, the, to, the, to our ESP. So in this case, will be 96 foot of, of inner deep tube. Um, we, we have designed this always to, to try to uh, get that, that gas back in solution, try to get it clean as much as possible. And then here is a very important thing. So the distance between the sensor 
and the, let me just stop it right here. So the distance between the deep tube and the bottom of the sensor has to be minimum. Because if we have a big distance there, what is gonna happen is that the, the, because of the difference between the, 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 the area, the, the, the cross, the, the, the cross uh, area there, the, the gas is gonna expand. So we always keep that in a, in a minimum distance. We have our procedures there, uh, but it's something very important we need to consider in this application. Okay, moving forward, so just to sum it up everything. So our tubing screens will uh, just uh, aiming for the coalescence effect, make the bubbles bigger. So the rising velocity of the, the bubbles will be higher. Uh, and then avoid, uh, avoid at, at this point, avoid turbulence. Always avoid the turbulence. It is gonna, um, have, it's gonna create small bubbles, which are very difficult to separate later on on the, on the well life, uh, in the, on the project. So then we have the two separated bodies. So we have the Bernoulli principle, the, the mechanical energy uh, conservation um, formula, and then the Venturi effect, the, 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 the changes on pressure and velocity um, in these points. And then we have the centrifugal force, always avoiding uh, turbulence and maximizing separation efficiency. And then we have the pressure top. So with the tubing screens and the deep tube, what we're looking for is to minimize the pressure drop so we don't see that uh, effect on the production. So the design criteria, we always uh, try to get as much information as we can and then try to get every, every aspect, analyze every aspect to get, I mean, to achieve that high separation efficiency from the intake, se the intake section. We have many different um, options from 50 slot, 70, 75 slot, depending on, on each case. Um, the gas separator ID, I mean, in these cases, for example, here in the Permian, there are many completion, um, the, many wells completed with five and a half casing, uh, 20 pounds, 23 pounds. Some of them, they have heavy wall casing. So there's always going to be a restriction there because the, the, the bigger you have your gas separator, you, your, your efficiency will be higher. So this is always that we have to take into account. So the gas separator ID, so a bigger gas separator ID will be higher separation efficiency, but always we'll have to keep that um, clearance between the casing drift and our OD on our bigger, um, our bigger OD on the assembly. The two leg, as I mentioned before, I mean, we can modify this. I mean, uh, if, the, if, the, if the design requires, we can this longer, shorter, but always to, to, to calculate pressure drop on the length of the tool because of the deep. So the helix size, as I mentioned before, once again, we don't want turbulence. What we want here is to break, break those gas logs and, and have a, a, a clean fluid flowing through the deep tube. Um, for the gas, uh, gas operations, or gas uh, applications, sorry. So we, we try to go with um, higher helix, like bigger helix. So the, the spaces are uh, bigger. So we, we don't generate that central force as strong as in a sand uh, application. The shroud, the, the shroud size, uh, we always work uh, pretty close with the ESP companies, making sure that all the, the dimensions, um, yeah, the, the internal dimensions between uh, the OT of the motor and the ID of the, the shroud are the, 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 the correct ones. The length of the shroud always be, they always have to be uh, very precise and the precise is better. Um, and we have the me mechanical well condition. So we always have to check on um, the inclination DLS and azimuth, so we avoid severe uh, angles that may or may not affect the tool. But it is I always have to be care very careful with that. I, even though when we're like installing tailpipes, some some cases we've seen will be uh, well with some problems. So we go as much as ten tailpipes. So we need to be uh, very careful with that and analyze the situation very carefully. Okay, Neil. Right, thank you, Carlos. Uh, like Carlos mentioned, um, pretty much what we are trying to do here is to basically 
include all the design principles that uh, goes when it comes to designing a gas separation or a gas regulating system. Uh, that's pretty much what uh, we're trying to do over here. And uh, like uh, you mentioned about the, the parameters that goes into designing these, they're all based on the well that we're trying to uh, basically help or the ESP in that well that we're trying to uh, basically help. So uh, let's just go over two case studies. Uh, the first one being right off the bat, if you look at the production chart on the left-hand side, uh, we can see it was a very gassy well. Uh, it was completed in 2016, ran for about uh, three years. Uh, it was, had a lot of interventions as uh you know, as uh, told to us by the operator, uh, that it's not just gas, but gas was leading to a lot of other issues as well. That is chemical issues like scale formation around the motor and inside the pump and everything. So uh, pretty much what we try to do here is uh, design something just to make sure that uh, this, uh, the gas is either separated or at least can be handled by the ESP. So it was it was a five and a half inch twenty pound casing. Pretty much most of the the wells over here is completed uh, this way, and that we can basically modify the design based on the uh, the casing the casing size of the well. So uh, obviously it you know helps us uh, to kind of understand what the best design is going to be and what's not. Hey Carlos, uh, real quick, could you just go back? All right. So yeah. So in this well, pretty much when uh, this garden shield was uh, supposed to be designed, uh, it was making about 400 production uh, with a water cut of 67%. There was a gas flow of 460 with a total GOR of 3,357. Now, uh, again, these are the parameters that we look into before designing something. Uh, if you look on the right-hand side, this was the ESP design before uh, that was used. And... Uh, if you look closely at the intake, it was the four. It was the four-inch intake, which, uh, like how Carlos mentioned before, we need to have that section shrouded, right? So that is something that we changed. Was instead of a, a lower tandem intake gas separator, we recommended or what is compatible with the guarded shield is uh, an intake 338 series, on top of which the shroud clamps, and above that is the upper tandem gas separator. Just in case, you know, whatever uh, gas goes inside, and just just to kind of purge them out, uh, the ones that we saw before. But yeah, Carlos, uh, let's go to the next one. And this is uh, like a like basically what the first most important part for this system to work is a shroud design. And to have those in a five and a half inch twenty pounds, we pretty much used the, the three hundred series intake motor seal sensors and a foreign series upper tandem gas separators just because it was outside the shroud. It was positively sealed on, on top and it was connected to the garden shield on the bottom. So all the fluid that goes inside of the pump has to go through this gas separator design. Now, if you look on the left-hand side, this is there are two main parameters. Again, Carlos had has mentioned uh, both of those before, one of which is we need to um, Make sure that we analyze the casing drift and the motor ODs and the shroud thickness so that we have the optimum distance between those two sections so that we have that uh, optimum velocities uh, for the gas to flow up the analyst outside of the shroud and inside of the shroud for the proper motor cooling. And uh, not go too fast, not go too slow, have that optimum velocity for that optimum connection of heat transfer. So, uh, again, the design of the garden shield, pretty pretty similar to what we saw even in the video with two tubing screens, two gas bodies, and a vortex section right at the very bottom. Uh, the reason we go with two pretty much in most of the wells are is uh, because of the amount of open area that it provides us. It gives us about 1,500, it's about 48, inch, uh, 48 foot of uh, tubing screens, so 24 each and about 1,500 square inches of open area, which the reason for which being we don't need in any pressure drop across the system to you know either promote you know, scale formation or any other issues but the ga two gas bodies and a vortex uh, the helix obviously was designed based off of the production all right so to put everything you know in perspective this is pretty much how we can understand how what improvements are seen after the installation it was very difficult like i mentioned had a lot of interventions and, uh, and shutdowns before but 
this one year, the first initial four or five months without the, uh, without the gas separator, the, 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 the later section after, you can right off the bat look at all these parameters. These are sensor parameters that we received from the operator. We can right off the bat see that the, the amount of fluctuations, and that pretty much tells us that it obviously isn't working at a high efficiency, right? So if you look at well, some of the numbers to just put, put a number to some of the parameters, that is the pump intake pressure. If you look at on the green, on the green chart, the, the green fluctuations, if you see on the left-hand side is, so it was about 800, 850 to 600 PSI. It was very difficult to get it below 600 PSI and keep it stable just because of the amount of free gas in this well and uh, going inside of the pump. And the other thing is the motor temperature was as high as 260 Fahrenheit. Obviously, again, going back and forth because if you remember the video that we saw earlier, there's these slugs that comes in batches. So that's pretty much why we are seeing that fluctuations. And the, the reason why it goes so high is just because of the, the amount of free gas that's present around the motor. And the total number of shutdowns, now this is something that you all probably can't see very clearly in this graph, but right at the very bottom, like if you see those brown do droplet sections right be uh, behind that, there's those blue patches, right? That's pretty much says what the, that's, that's recording every shutdown. And if you look closely, it's about 10 to 15 shutdowns per month before installing or having any sort of gas uh, handler with the ESP. Now going to the right hand side of this graph, uh, that is after the installation, again, visually itself, we can understand that this is definitely performing better uh, again, to put numbers to it, PIP, uh, we were able to get it below 600, keep it over there as long as we can. Obviously, there's still going to be a, lot, a little bit of gas, but eventually, if you look at uh, the comparison between the before and after, you'll see how much the improvement has been. The other thing, a very important thing, is the motor temperature, because one of the issues with this well, like I mentioned before, was having this high motor temperature was promoting scale formation uh, around the motor or inside the pumps. And this is something that we were able to go, get down to a more cooler values to 160, 180, which is considerable com comparing it to 260 Fahrenheit before. So that's when we, these are the parameters that we can uh, look into and understand how exactly, you know, th uh, this system is affecting the performance of the pump. Total number of shutdowns, again, like you see the blue the blue patch is right uh, behind the, the droplets. It's barely any for these, these past five, four or five months. And that's pretty much had about six to eight shutdowns till date. So uh, this is pretty much what I wanted to show you all for the first case study. Obviously the production rates is what we'll see in the next slide. Again, that that's gonna show, we, show us uh, what eventually how we are getting more production compared to what it was before. Now this, this tool is not magically gonna you know, increase the production rates. Obviously what it does is decrease the number of shutdowns so that we can keep it running as much as we can and produce as much as we can. Again, on the left-hand side, if you see the difference between each data points, it's considerable. Like if you see the, the fluctuations, it's, it's, it's way more when you compare it to the right-hand side where it's linearly declining, like how the well is supposed to decline, man. The production rates are very close to each other. Why? Because of the lower number of shutdowns. So eventually there was a drastic improvement in not only pump performance, but overall production um, was improved as well uh, for this well. And now we let's move on to the second case study, which is a similar, a similar well again in the Permian Basin, Wolf Camp A formation, a little lower production rate, about 350 barrels per day and a little lower GORs and GLRs. Uh, and this was this well was almost reaching to an end of uh, its, its pump curve. So like just to kind of push it till the very end is pretty much why the operator decided to, uh, get, uh, to go with this system. The, on the right hand side, the design again, the ESP design is pretty similar to what, uh, what the previous one was with a four inch intake system, which was obviously uh, replaced into the, the slim equipment, the 338 series intake with an upper time gas separator. Next slide is pretty much uh, similar to what we saw before. Again, same design with two tubing screens, two gas bodies and a vortex. Very important, we make sure that we talk to the, uh, the ESP operating, uh, the ESP manufacturers uh, that we need to understand these two parameters, that is the shroud thickness, 
the the and the distance between the the motor uh, i mean the the bottom of the sensor and the shroud that distance is very critical now and that's uh, and we make sure that we work very closely with the esp operators so that you know we get everything right uh, the way it's supposed to be designed so that the separator the gas separator by itself does something and it's not ruined by some that something that we did not pay attention to that that are these two parameters and again this was installed in march of 2019 and we can see the, uh, the before parameters in the next slide that again see the number of shutdowns the total fluctuations in uh, in in all of the parameters uh, put a number to it the pump intake pressure was very so very difficult for it to go below 650 psi uh, was going in that 800 to 660 uh, 650 uh, range. Motor temperature was higher than the previous well, where it was going as high as 280 Fahrenheit, and in some cases not as much as, uh, but it was, it was still pretty high compared to what we're going to see afterwards. And the total number of shutdowns this was way worse than the other one, with 15 to 20 per month, because of a combination of not just gas uh, issues that's fluctuating, but also that the gas, the free gas, actually promoting. The scale formation, which is pretty much why there was a total number of shutdowns was so high, and the total amount of failures were super high. So after the installation, again we see we, we have a few. Can we go to the next slide, please, Carlos? Yeah. So after the installation, we see again the total pump intake pressure going linearly down is pretty much what we would like to see. It was it was gone a little bit below 600 PSI. I was trying to, we try to kept it uh, and maintain it at, at that section. The total fluctuations were still there. It was, like I said, it was a little more severe well, but eventually the the, uh, the severity of that is was considerably reduced after the installation. This, this Both of these graphs were after the installation of the garden shield with the shroud. So the total number of shutdowns again since March, you all see the, this is the, the blue patch that I was talking about. If you all look, at, uh, look down, those patches were the ones basically that says uh, the number of shutdowns, right? You can look at and what we've gotten information from the operator that the total number of shutdowns was about eight to 10, not per month, but since March. So total production rates were kind of maintained how it's supposed to, uh, pump intake pressures were kept as stable as possible. Total fluctuations in all of the parameters were kept as stable as possible. The product. Now, this was one of those wells. If you if you go to the next slide, this was one of those wells where we like like I mentioned, we needed to push it to that last um, section of that uh, pump curve of that ESP so that we can successfully then convert it to a, you know, whatever artificial lift system we need to. But in this case, it was a rod pump that was connected uh, converted. So before the installation of the Guardian Shield, we have again we said the production rates were going. To, very low, it, just, it was very difficult for it to maintain at higher levels just because of total number of shutdowns and um, so, much, so many interventions because of free gas inside of the pump and high temperatures because of free gas around the motor. And after the installation, again, this was something that was expected by the operator was to get go back to the section of production rates where we were supposed to be in this well go back over there, again, come back linearly till the point where we, we can successfully convert it to a rod pump system. So that's pretty much what we did in this one as well. And after September, um, we, uh, the, the operator converted this to a rod pump. And now the other neat thing about this design is stake off the shroud of the ESP. Do, uh, all we got to do is take off the shroud of the ESP, do some inspection on the, uh, on the tools, maybe replace some of the parts because uh, none of the, the whole 96 foot of all those uh, parts are not welded together. So that's something that uh, gives us the flexibility of pretty much mixing and matching whatever need is needed to and pretty much use that same sim that same system after cleaning or whatever to uh, with a rod pump system, which works as a gas separator for a rod pump now. So that is another neat thing uh, with this tool is that it is interchangeable and compatible with different artificial systems. Just need to tweak a little bit here and there. Obviously, the helix sizes, like how Carlos mentioned before, uh, uh, what needed to be higher 
if you know we don't have a lot of solid issues. And again, this was in the later section of the uh, later uh, later life of the well where solids were not that big of an issue, but we still changed the helix sizes a little bit just to make sure that we're still getting that gas separation. But uh, but yeah, that's uh, those are the two uh, case studies that I had for you guys. But what we were trying to do here is to just to kind of show you all the effects of uh, this gas separation tool. Uh, you know the uh, the pump parameters before and after the the total production before and after, and it was uh, in most of these wells uh, where you know we have these CSPs and high gas issues. Uh, it's very difficult to get that pump intake pressure lower than what's needed to even 600 psi. It's very difficult to even keep it maintained over there. Motor temperatures it was very difficult to maintain at a stable lower rate close to the fluid temperature. So that is uh, something uh, what we were trying to help and. The, the secondary factors or the secondary failures because of gas, that is scale issues, because of this high more high temperatures around the pump was something that was needed to be uh, addressed in, in this webinar is pretty much how we can do that using this system. Uh, but yeah, uh, so this is pretty much what we have for you guys and we're gonna be here for a while. Whatever questions you all have, just uh, feel free to ask us. And uh, we also have our contact information just in case uh, you all want this presentation. We can uh, either email you all or give us a call. No matter what, you know, what questions you all have, uh, we'll be happy to answer them. But yeah, we're going to be waiting here for a bit so that we can answer all of your questions. Thank you all for joining us today. We have different case studies. We have with different papers that we have presented with uh, different cases uh, in, uh, on this on this application. Um, we are gonna leave those um, those uh, specifications on the comments right below, so you can find ESP papers, tow uh, pressure petroleum papers in related to the same uh, the same application. We have saw here uh, about eighty eight. Um, configurations on the, the Permian Basin. So we got information that we can share with you if you need it. So we're gonna just uh, wait a couple of minutes to see if someone has any question. Well, one of the questions that, uh, that we got here is, we have some of these wells here in the Permian Basin are, which we understand, and we have spoken to a lot of these operators who feel uh, or has encountered the same issue is, uh, there's a lot of foam issues in these wells. Uh, now, yeah, like how Carlos mentioned, we are not trying to have a lot of turbulence in this system, you know, because that basically promotes more foaming. But one of the design changes that we try to do in such situations uh, where, you know, the, the, the issue or the severity of foaming is higher is we try to tweak a little bit in the design is either go uh, open it up, the screens open up a little bit more so that we have more open area, creating lesser turbulence. The other, the other thing that we try to do is uh, the vortex the vortex shield that we have at the very bottom, we try to either eliminate it or change the helix size so that we can minimize the turbulence as much as possible. And that's a very, very good question because that's something we have, we have learned the hard way. All right, so I have another question here. Let me just read it. So what is, what is the maximum DOR that this tool can handle? So um, so we have we have had like many applications. So we have uh, had like DORs from 1,000, 2,000, uh, 3,000, and uh, some cases up to 12,000, so which I was uh, like really high DOR. So there are some modifications that we can do with this equipment, which is great. Uh, depending on the wellboard conditions, we, we can have uh, these uh, bigger separation bodies. All right, so what will help us is to decrease those dragging forces because of what we have here is always have like the buoyant force and the dragging force. So they are in opposite teams. So the buoyant force is going to try to get our gas bubble and uh, just push it upwards, and our dragging force is uh, so which is like the fluid. Uh, flowing downwards, uh, uh, just keep the, the bubbles uh, or like try to get the bubbles downward. So what we're already looking for is to get that velocity reduced when it, the fluid is already inside of our equipment. 
but the, the great thing of this technology is that we can modify that is uh so depending on, on 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 the severity also of the problem, so we can we can and we have done that. Okay, the right any right. So, uh, huh? yeah. Okay, so there this is one question about the pump intake pressure. Now that is something uh you know depending on the pretty much uh, what life of the well we are in, but initial stages or like the second installs, it's very difficult uh, for uh, operators or the pump to basically go below the 600 PSI threshold value. That's pretty much what we're trying to uh, attain over here with the system. And like I mentioned or show, showed you all before, where it's possible to go below that threshold value, whatever it is that you'll have, you need to basically analyze it before uh, just see the failures before or all the all the values before installing the new one so that we can have a right design accordingly to basically bypass the uh, the threshold value that has been critical so but yeah like i mean it, it totally depends uh, what formation where we are what the life of the well we are at like like i said majority of the the, um, the installations that we have had in uh, the Delaware Basin, a lot of operators, you know, mostly Wolf's Bay formation, having it's super difficult to kind of get below that 600 psi uh, value. So, but yeah, I mean, that's something we need to analyze. Obviously, uh, what we are trying to do here is to get the best out of the well, also get the best out of the pump. Mm -hmm. You need also I got another question here. We're receiving a so uh, can we modify this technology to incorporate a sound control system? So, yeah, so it's, yeah, we can, um, but every single time we need to evaluate how, we, uh, how this will affect the, the, the gas separation system. So as I, as I mentioned before, we have the tubing screens um, in, in different slot sizes. For example, a 20, 20 slot tubing screen will um, will break more like the sand uh, slugs that we uh, some of some of the time we have uh, on these horizontal wells. They have a one mile or the one and a half mile laterals. So and they, 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 we, they, we produce that sand slugs as well. So what what we what we uh, um, aim here is to homogenize that fluid as well. So we that we um, break that sand uh, slug and then the vortex will help us to separate that and to deposit the, the sand due to the centrifugal force because the same concept applied on the solid and the in the sand sorry on the sand um, precipitation here so the sand separation so the solid will have a higher density so the solid will be uh, stand, because of the vortex effect, the sand will be sanded to the walls of the of the of the separator, and then it will be sanded down, and uh, it will be stockpiled on the mood joints inside below. But yeah, absolutely, we can. Um, but again, we need to uh, evaluate uh, the severity of those two problems, which is sand and gas, and um, and modify the the, the equipment. The, the, the configuration. Um, Neil, do you have more? Uh, did, did you receive more? There questions? is one very common question that we've been receiving. Uh, it's uh, nobody has asked right now, but there's something you know, pretty much like how I mentioned in the in the design that we need to use a shroud. The system is not going to work the way it's supposed to work without a shroud system. You know, it, it is a gas separator system uh, made to use. Uh, with a shroud for an ESP. So yeah, and most of the newer wells where, especially in the Permian Basin with five and a half inch casing, 20 pounds, 17 pounds. Uh, we, I, I understand using a slim equipment in an initial install is a little, you know, something that is kind of uh, difficult to justify or to get that production rates. But when we're seeing that gas is actually affecting the overall the overall expense that when it comes to running operating costs or pulling costs, all of that stuff happens even initially. And some decision has to be made. That is when we recommend using a gas separator system with a slim equipment, with a shroud to make sure that we can, even though get maybe lower production in the initial stages, but make a run as much as we can uh, with as less uh, lower interventions as we can. 
but yeah we have had majority of the wells in the second installation after you know we've had the first initial life and the gas starts increasing that's pretty much where uh, most of the operators have issues with as well but just to let you all know it's compatible but just because of that five and a half inch casing 20 pounds 70 pounds it's uh, things would have been way different if it was a seven pound um, or a seven inch casing you know so but yeah this is something that we've just uh, always had um, kind of like something we need to mention to start but that's I guess that's pretty much all we got but yeah we have our uh, contact information over here just feel free to call or uh, email us and just uh, we can share with you the presentation of that's what you'll need we do have a lot of papers uh, that we have published at SPE and other forums that we can share um, but uh, if you don't have anything else Carlos that's pretty much else pretty much mm -hmm. all we got yeah, thank you so much, Neil. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, if you need anything else, please email us or call us. Um, we're in 24-7. Thank you all. Be safe. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Take care.